Also in that uh, audience, our, our speak, speakers was uh, Ilse Churyanikt. Ilse is, uh, is the CEO of Mars. Now those of you who might have heard of Mars in the recent past, it's an innovation uh, organization in Toronto. Uh, it's an incubator of uh, new companies or who are innovating. And um, she is a very powerful lady. Uh, in fact, her husband is David Naylor, who is the president of the University of Toronto. Here is a couple which is very powerful. Now she 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 went to India along with uh, Dalton McGinty, the premier of Ontario, on a trade mission recently. And she said, "Well, because we were in a trade mission, we had the chance to listen to the most prominent people of the uh, society sorry, in India." And everyone, without exception, spoke about India's achievement in science and technology. So, so I thought maybe this is a good time to also talk about science rather than, well, India's dimensions in, in arts and sculpture and architecture and uh, uh, spirituality are, of course, well known. Let's talk about science. And so science and engineering is what uh, my subject is going to be. I'm going to talk about one particular aspect of engineering and how it is important to the society. And this is uh, the title of this talk is uh, from Himalaya to Bhuj, the forces that shape and shape the earth. If you can have the lights down, maybe you can see this better. Is there a control on the lights? Earthquakes, and as I warned you before, this is going to be a serious subject in some ways, but it will also talk about, talk about the resilience of mankind and the courage that we can see in these lives there. The, the most devastating earthquake that has taken place in the history of the world, or at least the known history, but probably the history because there were not so many people at one time was the one which took place in 1976 in China, July 28th, at 3.42 a.m. And we'll talk about all of these terms, their magnitude, but the fatalities that that earthquake caused was officially estimated at 255,000, but most unofficial estimates, and it's very hard for people to governments to count, and particularly certain governments do not give the full figures. The, the normal estimates that are accepted worldwide of the actual fatalities in that is 655,000. That's the most devastating destructive earthquake in terms of loss of life uh, that was caused, that has happened in the, in the last uh, century or so. There are some grainy pictures from that um, event. And the earth moves, of course, and it um, causes the buildings to fall, uh, land to move. Now, as a contrast, 23 years later, 1989, October 17, 5 or 4 p.m., a magnitude 7 earthquake took place in Loma Prieta, uh, which is in California. And it's not, well, it's not as strong as the previous one, but fairly strong earthquake as we will, a little bit later on, we'll talk about this magnitude. But the loss of life was just 67, although there was a lot of property loss. And uh, just as a matter of interest, this energy release that we're talking about here, is uh, in that type of earthquake is about 30 million tons of TNT, which is about 10 times the total bombs uh, that were uh, used in the World War II. Uh, so it's a huge, huge energy. There were, this was the clock that stopped at 504. And the worst, uh, worst uh, most fatalities took place in this highway collapse. Uh, Unfortunately, there was a World Cup game going on at that time, exactly at that time in the, in the uh, Calandria Park. There were 60,000 people assembled, so most of the highways were empty comparatively. Five o'clock otherwise would be stuffed with 
cars, and so that was an unfortunate thing. But that was uh, that was the Bay Bridge. Of course, one of the spans slid off. The point I was going to make is why these two earthquakes of similar nature, more or less. I mean, one was slightly less strong than the other one, but they had such a big difference in the number of people killed, and. Uh, we have to learn from this. Why is this difference? What was too different? And we'll talk about this later, later on. Uh, it's really in, in word, but most people know this uh, phrase, this earthquakes don't kill. It's the buildings that kill. And see, if your buildings will fall, you'll have a loss of life. And of course, loss of property. Historically, from 1900 to 1992, there have been these countries most affected, the basis of statistics from that area, from that period. China comes at the top, the number of lethal earthquakes, 151, those which killed more than 1,000, 17, those which killed more than 10,000 are 7, and those which killed more than 100,000 are 2. And if you go down that table, you have got Japan, Italy, Iran, Turkey, USSR, Peru, Pakistan, the more recent one in Pakistan, 2005 earthquake, um, in estimates of fatalities, officially 61,770, unofficially it's about 80,000, and Chile. Uh, as, but there are other countries, of course, which have had devastating earthquakes. This is just a snapshot of what um, the most lethal ones, uh, as I mentioned to you, unofficially. Tangshan, China, 1976, 655,000 is probably the most lethal, but officially it comes at number two. The, the most uh, fatalities have been in 2004, Sumatra earthquake, which caused the tsunamis, as you all know, which hit a number of countries. Uh, and of course, the worst hit was uh, Indonesia and Thailand, but also hit were, were India and Sri Lanka. Uh, we had a lot of loss of life was caused. Then there are other earthquakes from 19, well, I have included from 1900s onwards. Uh, since we don't have much, rec well, we have records of the older ones. The number of fatalities may not be high because the population densities were low. Uh, but these are some of the earthquakes that have taken place uh, historically. And you can see, therefore, that this type of hazard, there are many hazards that, they are, that the nature throws at us. But this is one of the hazards which is uh, the most devastating in terms of uh, loss of life, injuries, and loss of property as well. Okay, what causes earthquakes? We have lots of mythological stories. One of them is a, a Japanese story which says there is a catfish uh, which uh, lies uh, in the ground there. I might have a pointer here somewhere. If I find one. Catfish. The catfish is a, lives underground, and whenever it moves, it shakes the earth. So that's what causes the earthquake. That's the story, mythological story. And there is this Japanese deity Kimura, who's always trying to pin the catfish down to prevent the earthquakes from happening. Quite a disjointed sort of story, but we have a campus comedy. Uh, on our campus, a story that goes around about this professor who is very fond of asking questions in the class, and the people, the students are really frustrated. One day he does over to some four plays himself. He says, "Okay, if uh, the CN Tower is 500 meters tall, what is my age?" So there's stunned silence. One person raises his hands quietly. He says, "Yes, sir." Yes, you are 60 years old. He says, quite right, how did you know that? He said, I have a cousin who is 30 and is only half crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a story of that kind, but, but don't, don't we all do the same thing? Whenever we can't explain a natural phenomena, we attribute it to God. I mean, one philosopher very rightly used the term 
Our God is the God of gaps. Wherever there is a gap in human knowledge, we attribute that thing to God. And when the gap gets filled, of course, we quietly we draw the gap, uh, God's role from there. So this is one, uh, one story. But let's look at the real cause of earthquakes, what causes them. And um, I use this title, The Forces That Shape and Shape the Earth. And Anil told me people were perplexed, confused about the title. What force are you talking about? Is it forces or force? Force may be God, of course. Uh, but no, this is not God. This, these are forces that cause this earthquake. And so let's look at these forces because uh, it's of interest to know about them. Okay, here is a cross section of the earth. And you have a crust which is rigid or solid. And then you have an upper mantle. Total thickness of this is about 50 to 60 kilometers. And then you have a lower mantle which is not solid but it's quite viscous. And molten, more or less molten. Then you have outer core which is also viscous. And then you have the inner core, very high temperatures at that level, 4,000 to 5,000 degrees Celsius, and of course, still not molten. Why do you think it's not molten if it's that high a temperature? Now, those who you learn science also know that if you have high temperature but also high pressure, things don't melt. The melting temperature goes up as the pressure exerted on a substance goes up. So this, of course, is under very high pressure over burden, so it doesn't melt even at that high temperature. But the rest of this mass from here to here is uh, molten. So the crust is about 0 to 35 kilometers, and then from the 35 to 60 is the upper mantle, and these are rigid. In fact, under the oceans, that depth may be less because the oceans could be 10, 10 kilometers deep or, or more. Uh, so that thickness will be even lower there. Now, this is plastic and very hot. And it's continuously churning because it's so hot and it's molten. And this thing on top of it is really floating on top of this molten mass. And if this molten mass moves around, the top should also move. Makes sense. But it was only not until 1912 that a German scientist, a seismologist, came up with the theory that really all of these Earth's um, continents that we see were not where we see them today. At one time, they were in some other place and came up with the theory of continental drift, which is now universally accepted, by the way. Most people believe that that's a, a sound theory. There are a lot of scientific proof to support that theory. 200 million years ago, all of these continents were a single solid mass all together. And the name that um, the scientists that Mengett gave it was Pentia. And 200 million years ago, these started to drift apart. Now what's the proof for that? There are a number of proofs for it, believing that this was all one mass. One of the reasons is of course if you try to fit all these continents as a jigsaw puzzle, you'll find it's quite easy to put, fit them together. The African continent will fit into South America quite nicely. The Eurasian continent will fit into North America quite nicely. Here is Australia and India, Australia and India, uh, which were all snugged up there. 200 million years ago. And then they started to drift apart. And it's very interesting to see how did they drift apart. All of this was ocean outside, but this was all one single mass. And it started to move apart. And the reason it moved apart was there was a chain of volcanoes through which this molten metal from the lower crust, the uh, lower, sorry, mantle which was molten, start to come up. So hot metal always tried to rise. And it, uh, there was a chain of volcanoes along a line. And these volcanoes, of course, will erupt. And they'll bring fresh molten lava up to the top. As they come up to the top, the two sides will spread apart. It has to make space for that. 
So the Pangaea starts to break up 200 million years ago because of the rise of this molten metal. And as these move away from two sides, the space that was created was, of course, filled with water. Now, it's interesting to see that this is the central part of the oceans where there is this molten metal from molten lava was coming up and still comes up. And this uh, sort of spreads out, and we'll see more pictures of that. This is, let's say, that's the surface of the earth, the crust, and that's the upper mantle, and this is the lower mantle, which is molten, and it starts to rise up. And it rises up in the mid oceanic place, it comes up here and pushes these two on the two sides uh, from the center. And so you have this continuously coming up molten metal coming out of the uh, of the Earth's mantle and pushing the two sides. And eventually, of course, at some place, uh, those things which are being pushed out start to go back under because the total volume of the Earth doesn't change. So something which is coming up has to go back down, and it sort of goes down or subducts, as it is called. And therefore, you see this trench here. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, and as it goes down again, of course, it comes to this hot temperature, it starts to melt, and it rises up, and you have these volcanoes formed inside the ocean. Uh, and they form like islands or arcs of volcanoes, which you can see many places, like the Aleutian Islands, uh, north of Canada. Um, and there is this continuous trench. Now, if you, or sometimes, of course, it comes. Uh, the spreading crust comes and hits the continental crust, which is uh, already a continent. Uh, then it starts to subduct under. It makes this part rise, and it also forms volcanoes. Now, the Andes of South America and the Rockies of North America have formed because uh, these pushing crusts coming up to the shore are pushing this up into the uh, towards the sky and forming these mountains. Now, interestingly, if you were to drain all the oceans, suppose you pulled a plug and drained all the oceans, what will you see? You will see right in the middle of the Atlantic, a ridge. That's where this molten metal is coming out and spreads out. Also, you'll see parallel to this somewhere here, a trench where this part of the crust is going under again. Uh, and these have been established by suboceanic surveys. Uh, which was carried out during World War II and later on people wanted to know what's the depth of the ocean and therefore subsonic surveys were carried out and now it's pretty, pretty well known that there is a, in fact, uh, so that's the mid uh, Atlantic ridge. Now it's, even today it's uh, molten metal is coming out or molten lava is coming out and the two sides are spreading out. So the Atlantic Ocean is expanding at the rate of seven centimeters a year. Every year it becomes wider by seven centimeters. So the Asia, or the Eurasia, and the North America, or the Americas, are spreading apart uh, by seven centimeters a year. In fact, it's very interesting because this mid-Atlantic ridge goes on surface in Iceland. And it goes right through Iceland in the middle of this. This is right Javik, the, the capital. And there are these series of volcanoes along the ridge. Of course, all these volcanoes cause the ridge to. In fact, within a period of about 10 years, uh, from 1975 to 1984 or so, uh, this ridge was spreading. And there was a difference of 7 meters over the 10 meters. So Iceland uh, spread apart by seven meters during those 10 years. And this was can of course be observed because right on the surface of the Earth. Uh, so those are some of the proofs that, uh, that support the theory of continental drift. Now sometimes, of course, they don't uh, go under each other, but they also slide sideways. So the one plate of the Earth slides sideways on the one side, the other slides on the other side. Now wherever there is a sliding or subduction, there is a potential earthquake source. Because they have friction, they do not always move easily, but they try to move, and when the, the pressure is too much, then they fracture. 
And as soon as they try flexure, there is a sudden movement between the two sides of the plate, and you have what is called a fault. And whenever there is a fault, you start an earthquake from that point onwards. to the Pangean, there is the North America, the Asia, or Eurasia, the Africa, South America, the Australia, India, and Antarctica. They were all together 200 million years ago and then they started to drift apart. The Indian plate started to move up at about 9 centimeters a year. 71 million years ago it was here and we described a journey of about 2,000 kilometers uh, coming up and hitting the Eurasian plate about 50 million years ago. Now one plate, one continental plate hit the other one. Nowhere to go. Where did it go? Upwards. It crushed the Eurasian plate and the Himalayas were formed. Okay. Even today the Indian plate is moving north at about um, 5 centimeters every year. The Eurasian plate is also moving north, but not as fast. It's moving at about 2 centimeters a year. So there is a difference of 2-3 centimeters. What's happening? First of all, India is shortening. Shortening by about 4 millimeters a year. Small amount. Himalayas is rising. And this is going on continuously. Uh, Himalayan mountains, of course, are, are the most beautiful example or the most exotic examples of the plate drifting and the formation of mountains because of the collision of plates. One plate colliding against other, both plates are of the same density. They cannot go under one another because they are all of the same density. They collide against each other and they lift up. So the mountains are formed. So that's what the India's journey from that Pentia 200 million years ago drifting upwards, moving quite fast initially, and then it, it hit. Uh, the plateau of Tibet, which is arid and dry today, 2,000 years ago it was near equator. And why do people know that? Because if you see the fossils in the Tibetan plateau, uh, they, are, they give you an impression they must have been in a wet, humid, warm climate. Tibet is arid and dry today, so definitely they were formed uh, these 2,000 years ago in the uh, in, in, in near equator, then they drifted up uh, as the plate moved. So those are some, uh, some of the slide which of course explains the formation of Himalayas. One continental crust colliding against the other doesn't quite go under, starts to rise and you get the formation of those mountains. Uh, the Himalayan mountains as you know and the, and the plateau, the Himalayas is 8,854 meters high and the Tibet, Tibet plateau is 4,600 meters high which is higher than any peak in Canada or, or, or United States and in fact higher than most peaks in the Alps, except a couple of them. Uh, so the plateau itself is higher than... So as I said earlier, it's moving north at 5 centimeters, uh, the Eurasian plate is moving at 2 centimeters, the India plate compresses by about 4 millimeters a year, and it spreads sideways as well, goes up as well. That's a beautiful view of Himalayas against the sunshine, the Mount Everest, it's rising at the rate of one centimeter a year, so its height is going up. Okay, this is a summary of all the plates that you can see. Uh, these are the lines which separate the plates. Now, this is what is happening. Here, for example, these plates are separating and moving away from each other. You can see it's moving away from each other. They are moving uh, sideways here. They are moving together here. 
So one is hitting the other one. They are moving up uh, and so on. Uh, well, this is this is South America. It is called and it's moving towards the continent and therefore it's pushing the Andes up. Okay. Similarly, in the North American side, out of west coast of west coast, west coast of the British Columbia, we have this uh, um, plate, Jean du Fuca, Juan du Fuca plate, which is moving towards uh, Canada, and it's of course has caused the rise of the Rockies one time. So those are the seven major plates uh, that I list here. The African plate of uh, 61 million kilometers square, the Antarctic plate, the Australian plate, the Eurasian plate, the North American plate, uh, and the South American plate, and the Pacific plate, the largest one being this. Those are the various ways in which these continents are move relative to each other. You can either have sliding this way, or you can have uplift this way, or you can have downwards for this way. Now this is the one which is the, the cause of tsunamis. Whenever you have an earthquake under the ocean, and if one part of the earth moves up relative to the other, and they move by quite a lot, seven to nine meters, for example, in the Sumatra earthquake. So this thing moved up nine meters, and that caused the overlying water to have a wave. Now, this wave, when it is in the ocean, it's only a few millimeters, a few centimeters tall. But when it reaches uh, the shore, it suddenly becomes very high. It could be 10 meters to 30 meters high. It travels at a very low rate, 600 kilometers an hour. So from the time the earthquake took place in Sumatra or Indonesia, to the time it arrived in India, there was a gap of one and a half to two hours. And if we had a warning system, people could have been alerted to the arrival of the tsunami wave. Uh, so unlike earthquakes, earthquakes you hardly have any warnings. A few seconds it happens and it finishes. But a tsunami which is caused by an earthquake can be, a warning system can be there. And there are now warning systems in, in, in the Indian Ocean which have just been installed. There are warning systems already in the Pacific Ocean. So tsunami warnings are possible. Uh, they will happen only, only when the earthquake is under sea, only when the type of motion is of that kind, and only when the earthquake is very large, magnitude 9 or so. Okay. And we'll talk about magnitudes in a little bit time. Okay, just to give you an example of the motion, we have the Canada, United States, West Coast. We have this plate moving towards this side, the Pacific plate moving towards the North American plate, and we have a subduction of one plate going under the other. And it, it causes earthquakes on the west coast from time to time. But the most dramatic ones <laughs> are those fault lines which we see uh, in California. This is called this is the famous San Andreas Fault, which runs 1,300 kilometers long, and it continuously is sliding. One plate is sliding, upwards or north, sorry, west, northwest, the other is going southeast. So that's the relative motion of the two sides. And it moves five to eight centimeters a year. Okay. So people who are doing geodesic survey, they continuously monitor this move motion. Now this motion accumulates and becomes quite large, there's going to be a fracture somewhere. And at that time there will be an earthquake whenever there is a fracture. So you can you can sort of have some idea that there is going to be an earthquake. Now how good that idea is, when is it going to happen, that's what we are going to talk about in a little while. But uh, that's the kind of, now San Andreas Fault moves quite a lot. The last the big earthquake in, in California, this is the fault line. Before the fracture took place, this, this was a continuous fence. Okay. And of course when the fault line breaks, the two sides suddenly jump with relation to each other, and you have a large gap between the two. In this, this gap was measured in a row eight meters between the two sides. This nice picture, you can see what happened here. That's obviously a fault line, one side is moved with relation to the other side, sideways. Another example, 1980 Algerian earthquake, and you can see it's about uh, three meters or so, nine feet. 
motion between the two sides. Okay, can we find out when the earthquake is going to take place? That's the next question we have. Well, there are some indicators, and these are called precursors in our scientific language. Uh, usually, a big earthquake may be followed by small force shocks. If you can measure them or can feel them, then there's a warning of an impending earthquake. If you can measure relative horizontal motion as they do in California all the time, they have these three or four satellites continuously measuring the distance between two sides of the San Andreas fault because they know that there is a fault line there. But it's not always possible to know where the faults are. Faults are sometimes under the ground, not visible on the surface, and it's therefore difficult. You might sometimes have uplift or tilting of ground. You might have wave velocity changes. These are, these are measurements of wave velocity which uh, seismologists use and minor, mineral people, mines, so those who explore minerals they use to find out velocities. There are changes in magnetism or electric resistance of the earth, sometimes changes in the well water levels. Now one interesting idea that people have is probably animals can feel these earthquakes before they come. I mean, our instruments will always be able to feel the earthquakes, I mean small tremors. But you don't have instruments everywhere. You have animals everywhere. And animals may be able to feel these earthquakes. But the problem is that animals behave in a strange way due to many, many reasons, not only just earthquakes. So you don't know whether to separate it from earthquake or uh, from other impossible reasons. And how well prepared you are to suspend all your education and your commerce and your uh, evacuate your building if you if the dog starts to behave in a strange manner. That's the problem, of course. You can never rely on that. But yes, that's a uh, that's a research area that has been pursued in many countries, including the United States, China, and Japan. The people try to uh, see the behavior of uh, animals prior to an earthquake. Lots of earthquakes happen uh, in these countries, and in fact, every day there are, there is an earthquake, although we can't feel that. Uh, today there was a bigger earthquake in China, 6.2 or something, killed killed a few people. Uh, but there are there are earthquakes every day. So can earthquakes be predicted by animals? Uh, I'll be fortunate if we could we could do that. There was one successful prediction, and it's an interesting uh, data that we have here. This was in 1975. Uh, the magnitude 7.4 earthquake which took place at 7.30 p.m. At 2 p.m. there was a warning was issued because they observed many of those things that I, I listed earlier. And in, in China, with the society they have, they can force people to evacuate, go out of the house. So most people went out, slept in, a, in tents or in an open ground. And as I said, earthquakes don't kill. It's the buildings which kill. Uh, some people, well, they waited from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, they said, well, nothing is happening. So they went back. And that, of course, resulted in a loss of life of 1,500. But mind you, that kind of earthquake in Taishan killed 655,000 people. So this was one uh, good prediction, but then they couldn't predict the other earthquakes. So it's very, very hard. The best people can do is, well, there is a 20% chance of an earthquake happening in the next 400 years. What do you do with that? What kind of information uh, doesn't help you at all? Well, people have been interested in earthquakes for a long time. Uh, China being one of the countries which is most affected, people started to measure earthquakes and how large they are. Uh, so the first earthquake measuring device was um, invented by Chang He, a Chinese scholar. Uh, there is a suspended pendulum with a ball there, inside, and uh, so as, the, as this moves with the earthquakes, uh, these are dragon mouths. The ball falls through one of the dragon mouths and comes to the mouth of the toad here. Uh, you can find out which direction the earthquake came by noticing where the ball is, if the ball should fall down. So that was the first, first measurement device. But more recently we have and this is what we should all know, I think, uh, because we read it all the time, is the so-called Richter magnitude, the magnitude 7, 6, 5 that we talk about. What is that? 
Now, this was devised by a, a Carl F. Richter of California Institute of Technology some time ago. Uh, and he gave it, so people call it the Richter magnitude scale. And he gave us a definition for it. The earthquake always starts at some point. It starts to fracture at some point, and then it propagates along lots of, say, 1,300 kilometers it might go. But it starts somewhere. The point where it starts under the earth is called a hypocenter, or a focus. And the point directly above is called an epicenter. Okay, now you know these terms that you've heard many often. That's where the fracture begins. Okay, it can start to propagate from there. If you place a seismograph which measures these earthquakes at a distance of 100 kilometers, it will measure on a, on a graph or on a chart the distance traveled by that seismograph or the the needle, needle will move in one direction or the other, and then there's a time scale. So they take this maximum value and take, and those who know the, the science, they take the logarithm of that. Now what it means is, it's a, it's a 10 to the power. See, if you say 10 to the power 1, it means 1. 10 to the power 2 is 100. 10 to the power 3 is 1000. So magnitude 1 is, let's say, 10. The magnitude 2 will be 100 times as large. The magnitude 3 will be 1,000 times as large. So every time you go up one magnitude, you go 10 times as large. So magnitude 5, 6 is 10 times as large as magnitude 5. The magnitude 7 is 100 times as large. Magnitude 8 is 1,000 times as large. The magnitude is 10, 9 is 10,000 times as large. Now anything that is magnitude 5 or more, is normally felt by people. And if it's six, then it starts to cause damage to buildings. If seven is quite quite devastating, eight is disastrous, and nine, if it takes place on the Earth's surface, then buildings near it, of course, will all, most of them will fall. Uh, so that's what the magnitude scale is. And we are talking about the magnitude all the time. Uh, this is what we mean by that. Now, I talk, want to talk about what uh, what are the effects of earthquakes? This is the interesting part. Now that we have covered the background of what earthquakes are, what they are caused by, uh, what are the measurements, and where do they happen? They happen wherever there is one continent, uh, one drift, con drifting continental crust meets another one. Now it so happens that all of the continents, like example, the, the, if you take the Pacific Ocean, and if you describe a circumference of the Pacific Ocean, that means you go from California, or let's start South America, Peru, Chile, uh, Chile, Peru, uh, Guatemala, uh, Mexico, uh, California, British Columbia, the Aleutian Islands, go around to Japan, Philippines, China, uh, and Malaysia, West, uh, and the coastal side of those. That's one Pacific ring. And because all of the continents are meeting, or the continental rifts are meeting at that point, 90% of the earthquakes take place along that circum-Pacific belt, which is called the Ring of Fire, because most of the earthquakes take place. The other one is, of course, where the Indian plate moves and meets the Eurasian plate, as I said, the Himalayas have been formed there. So along that belt, which is Greece, Turkey, uh, the northern part of India, the Himalayan belts, the Himalayan foothills, that's another uh, one which causes and the rest of the earthquakes probably take place there. And then there are other small uh, areas where earthquakes might happen. So what are the effects of earthquakes? Uh, first thing they will cause is motion of the ground. Grounds might crack up, move apart from each other. And this is the view from 1980 Algeria earthquake where the two sides just opened up and it devoured some animals inside there, standing on the field. Ground can move and you can see the rail tracks uh, all bent up because the ground has moved during the... Then the landslides can take place. Large masses of earth can slide down from there, from the mountains. and. That may sometimes cause a lot of loss of life. The first two ground cracking really, unless you are you put your building on the crack, uh, you will be unwise to do that. But if you put your building on the crack, of course you're going to sink down into that. 
but usually you can avoid doing that. Uh, but one, one factor that may cause the loss of life is the landslides, a huge mass of earth slid down from that mountain, uh, Kuraskaran mountain in Peru, came down at 200 kilometers and completely buried two tons. Ran Rahera in UK and killed 20,000 people. So that's one example of what uh, landslides can do. But these are rare. Okay. As I said before, and there's another one. If you take a um, sand in your bowl and you put some water in it and you put a little bit of a weight on top of it and then you shake that, what do you think happens? That thing sinks inside. It becomes quicksand really, and it cannot take any weight. So when the earthquake shakes the sandy soil, which is filled with which is a lot of water table, it becomes quicksand and anything on top of it sinks down. Right? It loses all its capacity to take any weight. So this is a dramatic example from the Niigata earthquake in Japan. Uh, these buildings, which were sitting on top of liquefiable soils, they just sank or tilted up, uh, became unstable. This one lying on its side, uh, untouched otherwise. But because the soil had lost all its capacity to, to bear this, they all uh, settled down. And then the tsunamis. The last one example of tsunami is the 2004 in Sumatra, and uh, it just uh, was devastating. Another view of that, and another one. Now, as I said, mostly it's the buildings that came. The 1976 earthquake in Guatemala, which is about the same as the Loma Prieta earthquake, seven magnitude, Loma Prieta killed 76. Uh, in fact, I give you another example. The, the Buja earthquake, 2001, was about magnitude 7. It killed at least 20,000. Figures kept on changing, but the last estimates 20,000. At about the same time, a little bit later, an earthquake took place in Seattle, uh, close to our border. Uh, it was about 6.7, slightly lower magnitude. But it didn't kill anyone. And the people who died were heart, died of heart failure uh, because of the shock. But, um, but it, the buildings didn't kill. Because the buildings were built better. And that's what we are going to show it in a little bit of time as we go along. But there are people who are still resilient, brave, courageous. This is a picture that I like. It's a picture from Guatemala, right after the earthquake. In all of the devastation, there are children who are smiling still. Among the rubble of God's Imam. Gives us hope. So, let's talk about this Boja earthquake. Because, as I said, the plates collide. The Indian plate collides with the Eurasian plate in India's north. And we'll see it closer views. And that causes certain parts of India to be very active seismologically. Our earthquakes uh, happen quite often there. And some of them are quite large. The last one that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides is the 2001 Bhuj earthquake. Uh, we usually, engineers from Canada, we have, we go out and see the survey, the damage caused after earthquakes, and we are probably, our teams have gone to almost all the recent earthquakes, including the Kobe earthquake, the Chi Chi Taiwan earthquake, the, the, Tur the Istanbul Turkey earthquake. Uh, the Bhuj earthquake, of course, the Loma Prieta, the North Ridge, and so on. Uh, we have data that we have collected, we have pictures that we collected, we have studied what's the cause of the damage and what we can do. So uh, I led a team of Canadian engineers to, to this earthquake site in Bhuj about two or three weeks after the earthquake had taken place. And we traveled for 10 days throughout, uh, throughout Gujarat uh, from Kutch. Uh, and about to, to Burj and to other places I'll show you. Uh, and so I've got some pictures and I'll try and relate these pictures to what we can do uh, to, to mitigate damage or loss of life due to this. Uh, this earthquake took place uh, at uh, near about Burj, 50 kilometers from Burj, 
at 8.46 a.m. on the 26th of January 2001, the Republic Day. Magnitude quite large, 7.7. .7. The final estimates of fatality is about 20,000. 20,000 and a few. Uh, 166,000 people were injured. Houses completely destroyed, 370,000. Partially destroyed, 931,000. And the financial loss was estimated as 21,300 crores or 7.1 billion Canadian dollars. Damage was greatest in Kutch, and sadly, of the 884 villages in that area, 518 suffered significant damage, 165 major damage, 175 were completely destroyed. That left only 26 standing intact without damage. Uh, that was a real uh, suffering for people uh, in that area. We visited the towns which had been damaged, and the towns of Bruch, Bachao, Rapper, Anja, and Gandhi Dam, and also cities, Ahmedabad, Jamnagar, Rajkot, Surendagar, Surat, and Patan had uh, a lot of damage. Let's look at India's map now. Of course, that's uh, Gujarat and the Kutch area, and that was the epicenter of that. That's where it started. It was felt uh, right up, up to Nepal, of course, and uh, up to here. Close up of the peninsula here. Uh, that's the Kutch area, the run of Kutch, and that's the Buj. And the earthquake epicenter was not, it's about 50 kilometers from here. And then you have the Anjar town, the Pachau, the Rapper, the Gandhi Nagar, and on this side is Ahmedabad, the large port town Nagar. Uh, so that's the area which was most affected, of course. Now what's happening there, as I said, the Indian plate is moving northwards. That's the Eurasian plate. So these arrows show that this is pressing against that. But there are some other minor plates on this side. There's the Arabian plate and there's the African plate. Now this shows that these are separating. They are moving apart from each other. So this part is moving upwards. This part is moving downwards. This part is moving relative on a sliding side sort of thing. And then here it's going, moving that side. Now here, right here, is the confluence of three different plates the Eurasian, the Arabian, and the Indian plates. They meet here, very near to uh, Buj. That's where it began. That's where the fracture started. And uh, this is a larger, larger view of the Arabian plate, the Eurasian plate, and the Indian plate, and all meeting at one point. Uh, somewhere close there is the fracture started. Now, wherever you see these dots, that means one part is pressing against the other one. Uh, here is the slide and so on. Okay, the, the area of Kutch has had many earthquakes, some, some quite small, three to five magnitude. And as I said, five magnitude doesn't cause much damage, really. But there are some large ones. 150 years ago, 1989, uh, or for 1819, uh, was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that happened here, you know, Buj is here, and that resulted in a, in a bund being made. It's called the Allah Bund. It's, it's like a small mountain or a hill. And it's prevented a river that was going down, so flowing south, got dammed up. Uh, but this was 150 years ago. The population density was small, so only a thousand people were killed in that. And people forgot about it, of course. Uh, but then, this one which happened in Bruj, now the population density is large, it's closer to the density of population. If you look at India's map, map you've got some areas which are really quite severely seismic, uh, the red ones. It's known to all of our uh, scientists in India, and of course outside. Uh, so India has been divided into different zones of different severity. The white ones means very little severity. Uh, 
I think this one became yellow after the Latour earthquake. Until then, people thought there wouldn't be any earthquakes in the, pen, in the plateau, the Deccan plateau, but there are some fault lines underground there. Um, so that's your, that's your Bhuj. And that's Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad is not very really severe. Uh, that is, uh, that's the area which is quite active. This one, of course, they are very serious zones. Interesting thing happened during the earthquake is that underground water uh, was pushed out. As the ground moves, it sort of squeezed the water out. And you had suddenly sweet water. Miracles. People thought God had intervened and brought sweet water to catch. Everything is, of course, brackish there. Uh, so there are these underground sweet water. But this is well known that in earthquake, earthquakes, that, that might quite happen quite often, that water from the underground source can be squeezed out to the top of the earth. But this is what happens to the villages. And this is what caused the loss of, most major loss of life. And it was quite, quite a, a, a sad, devastating view to visit these places after the earthquake. And why did this happen? Well, there's some other views of Anjar. Anjar is a typical sad story. Um, and there's a sad story from Bhut. This Anjar is a town, this 26th of January morning, Republic Day, a parade of school children going in the early morning in a street which was flanked by old masonry buildings. And the earthquake happened at that time. The buildings came down and killed 200 children in that procession. Uh, in fact, even in Ahmedabad, uh, Swami Narayan school uh, f fell down and killed all the students who were there uh, using the, these Republic Day ceremonies. And there was a hospital in Bhuj, uh, which was 220 or so per, uh, patients and nursing staff. Morning of 26 January, there was the celebration of flag hoisting. So all the doctors had gone to the flag hoisting ceremony taking place in an open area, the collector is there. And so they were all safe. But the hospital came down, killed all of the patients and all of the staff. Uh, there was no hospital left. In. And so for the next three days, there was nowhere to go. There's no hospitals, people are injured. Uh, there's no, 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 nothing to go to. But let me start with Ahmedabad. Why should there be trouble in Ahmedabad? Ahmedabad was 400 kilometers away from the epicenter. Usually when you go farther away, you don't get any damage. But a thousand or over a thousand people lost their life in Ahmedabad. And one of the reasons which we'll talk a little bit more about is that we are very fond of building buildings which have an open ground floor. We put our parking spaces there, we have our retail stores there, so we have just columns coming down, sticks coming down, and everything else is supported on top of that. Now that's, of course, certainly a disaster when an earthquake happens. Whenever an earthquake happens, that floor, which has only columns, will certainly fail or be damaged seriously. And that was the only reason why people lost their life in Ahmedabad. All the buildings which had this type of construction either failed or were seriously damaged. This is one of them. There was floor, there were four blocks of this kind, two and two more here. These two are completely gone. Because they fell down. These two are also very seriously damaged. They had to be evacuated, of course. Uh, they were quite bad in the ground floor level. You can see there are only columns, sticks here, and a solid uh, thing on top of it. And all of these columns had, of course, so we, they supported them temporarily so the building will not fall down. Of course, the building has to be pulled down eventually. It cannot be repaired. But at least until such time, they have to support this. So you'll see these uh, temporary supports there. But this is gone. The lower part of the columns is gone. So this is going to fall, uh, or was about to fall. Uh, this 10-story building just been completed and people have just moved in. Again, it had a ground floor which was a parking for the tenants. And, uh, and so one part of the building completely collapsed. 89 people lost their life. Another building which is quite famous is the Mansi building, 12-story building. 
This is where the other block was. This is the staircase which connected this other block on this side. This was also damaged, but the other one just fell down. Uh, it's completely rubble here. Uh, fortunately, well, still 22 times. Many buildings in Bhuj, which is of course close to the epicenter, of course failed because of that. This one failed in between. Because they had, they had built the first three floors, they built next three floors, and the connection wasn't too good. Uh, so, so that's a weak point. The, the earthquakes will seek the weak point in your building and will, will destroy it there. So this was the town of Sam Kelly, and uh, this builder had just finished building this very nice bungalows. And again, he made the mistake of putting an open area in the ground with some very thin columns and all of these blocks which have not yet been occupied, fortunately, they all, of course, came down or were finished. Okay, Let's see how this works. engineers find out exactly how the building will move. And this is of course exaggerated, but um, this is a real building. Uh, in this case, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories. Uh, and I have put uh, the real earthquake on the ground. Um, I have not made the ground move. Ground should also move. But I have just shown the, the motion of the building relative to the ground. And it moves quite a lot. Uh, and you can feel it uh, as you go on the top, top of the building, you will certainly feel that. Okay. Um, my students do this, uh, of course, as part of their research work, and uh, so I, I was showing this, uh, these kinds of slides to an audience, and, uh, and they said, wow, your students are very smart. So we have this campus story about smart students. Uh, there was this girl who was a student, and somebody asked, which books help you most in the university? And she said, two of them. Now, which ones? The first one is my mother's cookbook. And the second is my father's checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have lots of campus comedies. <laughs> OK. So what can you do to prevent this uh, loss of life? or damage from earthquakes. And I said buildings really are those which kill people, not nothing else. Uh, occasionally the landslides might, but uh, really uh, mostly, and the tsunamis will, of course. Tsunami case, you mostly you can give warnings, you can prevent loss of life. Except when you are very close to the point where the tsunami generates, then you have 10 minutes or so. If you are far away, then you have more time. And also, tsunami is a very interesting thing happens in tsunami usually. See, when a tsunami happens, you first see the, the water receding, going away from your land, moving away. And then it comes as a wall of water. Now, in the coasts, coastal areas of Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka, the fishermen, they live there. And they saw this um, water receding. And the water receded, all the fish were on the ground, trembling, dying. And the children found this was remarkable. They could collect these fish without having to do anything. So they all went to collect these fish, and then suddenly this wall of six meters of water came flooding in. And you can see the consequences of that. Uh, so anyway, besides the tsunami where you can get a warning, where you can uh, certainly find if something is happening. In fact, it happened in Indonesia. There was a group of um, visitors or in, in, a, in a hotel, and there was this young girl who had studied in her school about tsunamis, grade 8. And she was told that water receiving means there is probably a tsunami. So she told her parents, and they believed her. So these, all of these tourists who were from, uh, from, from Germany, many of them from Germany, most of them, they evacuated the host, host, hotel and ran away. Unfortunately, the tsunami came a little later on, but they were safe. 
So you can do something about those. But buildings is, is, is a problem because there's not much warning. There's no time to evacuate a building when the earthquake comes. Okay? And you don't have any warning of an impending earthquake. So what can you do? Well, there are many things that you can do. Use a structural material that is ductile. Ductile means something which can bend without falling down. Like a cane. A wall of brick is not ductile. It cannot take any flex. It will simply fall down. But steel, steel column, can bend a lot without collapsing. So material like steel is ductile. Uh, but masonry, brick masonry, is not ductile, it's very brittle. Reinforced concrete, concrete by itself is brittle. It is something like brick. But if you put reinforcement inside, a steel reinforcement inside, then it can become quite ductile. And we can design you know, concrete buildings which are fairly ductile and will be as good as a steel building. So first thing that you do is to, to build uh, with a material that is ductile. The second thing you can do is to tie the structure together. Um, and I'll show you some examples of what happens if you don't. You avoid unnecessary mass. Okay, what is earthquake? Really, what happens is you, you are driven a car, you've driven a car. If you suddenly apply brakes, what happens? You are thrown forward, as if somebody pushed you. The point is that if you take a mass, which is your mass, and you either accelerate or decelerate it. Decelerate, accelerate means suddenly give it a speed, or, or decelerate means to give it a brake. As soon as you do any of those things, then you experience a force. And this force is proportional, or is a product of the mass times the rate at which you are decreasing the velocity. The faster you apply the brake, and the heavier you are, the more force you will experience. So really that's what earthquake does. It causes a force which is caused by these accelerations and accelerations of the ground, uh, which gets amplified as you go up, as we saw in that the slide there. Uh, so you, you avoid unnecessary mass. Use simple and symmetric structures. Well, we often make some very complicated uh, structures, uh, and sometimes they cause a trouble. Okay? Yeah. Well, they, they look nice, all right. Uh, in Toronto, I was there. They were just opening the Crystal Gallery. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange type of structure. You should go and see it next time. But just opened this weekend. Uh, so avoid uh, avoid very complex type of structures, particularly if you're in an earthquake zone. Toronto is not a very serious earthquake zone, so that's fine. But uh, uh, out in West Coast, which is Columbia, you should probably do something. Don't suddenly change your strength. As we saw this open story, which is only columns, and then you have solid, rigid walls, then that's the real disaster waiting to happen. And then inside your buildings, most of your tables will fall down if you have library shelves, the shelves will come out unless you bolt them to the ground or to the floor. So if you are in a serious seismic zone, you should bolt things to the ground, okay? otherwise they will topple over. Um, so those are the things that you can do. So as I said, some things are ductile, some are not. Chamber and steel are ductile. Concrete is not ductile unless properly reinforced. And unreinforced masonry is quite brittle. This is what happens in Anjab. You have unreinforced masonry. There is no reinforcement in this masonry. In fact, there is not even mortar, mud mortar. Just they build with mud, mud mortar because that's the local practice. Okay. The roof is not tied to the walls. Now that building is certainly going to fail uh, in an earthquake. So all of the buildings in the six, 170 villages that were completely destroyed, 580 that were partially destroyed, or were of this kind. They were random rubble masonry without even a mortar. Uh, avoid unnecessary mass. And we do that even in our part of the world here. Uh, this is the Olive View Hospital. Beautiful hospital building. They had uh, overlooking the ground floor where the patient uh, rooms are, second floor of the rooms are. They put some garden here. 
on top of a, a parking area. So they put two or three feet of earth there. Now that's a lot of weight. And it's unnecessary weight if you are in an earthquake country. And certainly oh, San Fernando in California is an earthquake country. Uh, and well, what would happen? Uh, that floor which had all of those uh, beautiful garden uh, simply crumbled. Because you have too much weight there. And you have too much weight, you get too much of force there. That's another view of the Olive View Hospital. Uh, it had to be pulled down. Uh, it has been rebuilt. Uh, and now they know how to build it better. So it again experienced an earthquake recently, uh, 1971, 1995, so now, say about 25 years later, uh, on Northridge earthquake. But it stands. This is the old building, it's not a new one. Butch, this building is, how many stories do you think it was? It's four stories. This was a four-story building with an open floor for parking. And that of course came down. Oh. Right there. And it's a beautiful building in, in Bhuj again. Uh, it was a three or four-story building. And it had a ground floor which was open. And so it fell and it toppled down. There was a lady here who was drying her clothes here. She wrote down safely came down to the ground. Nice ride here. Yeah. <laughs> I missed myself there taking pictures. You have what is, we call them the captured columns. You have a column which is going up and then you suddenly build a wall halfway and wall another way. So all of the punishment is in that part and all of those columns will definitely fail. Uh, we have a term for them called captured columns. Bad thing to do. If you have all, you should have all on both sides, that's fine. But if you didn't have all on either side, uh, then you have problems there. So what do you do if there is an earthquake? Well, you, you can't go out. There's not enough time. How? Oh, maybe on the ground floor you have a door outside. Even then it's probably difficult. So the best thing you can do is to go under something which is solid. Um, under the tables here, okay. uh, or under a door jam, door lintel. If you stand under the door lintel of the door, probably better because the wall will fall down this way. Uh, these tables might stand. So uh, this is Miss Jennings' class, and uh, if you experience an earthquake, you sh should listen and go under. I'm not asking you to go under the table. <laughs> But thank you for listening to me, not for listening to God under the table, but listening to my talk. Well, this was a good experience for me. We have talking about, um, I should end with a story maybe. The senator's fever these days. Uh, so we have two types of senators here. We have the hockey playing senators and the other senators. And so this is a story about the senators. This goes around in our campus. Uh, it goes around in the name of vice presidents of the university, but this works well with senators. So a newly appointed senator, by, he's still not elected senator, so the prime minister appoints a senator. And so the, the newly appointed senator phones his wife, says, how do you like to be the wife of a senator? And so the lady says, which one? <laughs> to answer any questions that you might have. Japan or the other one in you know uh, Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. So, what kind of precautions are they taking to ensure that they are? Um... Yeah, there are there are a number of things that they can do. Now, one is, of course, as I already said, 
you have to build with that tile material. If you're building, I mean, hundred stories cannot be made first concrete, it has to be steel. Uh, so you build with steel, and you have different kinds of steel, some of which are more ductile than the other. That's number one. Number two, you can sometimes isolate the buildings. That means you put this on the rollers. Okay. The interesting thing is if you are on a roller, then you don't even feel the earthquakes. You stay put, the floor the, the moves. Okay. Uh, like this chandelier, hanging from the ceiling. If an earthquake happens, what will happen to this? Nothing, it will just stay there. It, the, the roof that will move. And you feel as if this is swinging, but it will not swing. There's nothing, there's nothing can move unless you apply a force on it. That's the Newton's law. Unless you put pressure on a thing, it can never move. And nothing is putting pressure on it because there's no force transmitted through those wires. So in an earthquake, nothing will happen to it. Similarly, if you are, if you're standing in a, say if you're on a train, and you're on roller skates, and if the train suddenly starts to move, what will happen to you? You think you will be moving backwards with relation to the train, but you are staying put, the train is moving. <laughs> you are not moving along with the train. So buildings can be put on isolators sometimes. Okay. Uh, so isolation devices are there. Then there are, there are other devices called tuned mass dampers, which are some sort of devices which work against the motion. The building wants to go this side, tries to push the building backwards. Uh, but the major thing is, of course, building with ductile material, properly reinforced concrete, a proper steel, symmetric plants, no change of strength across the floor, you've got the same type of structure going up. Uh, all of those things, if you do, you can build even tall buildings in, in Japan, or in China, or in Taiwan. Uh, and they're they are trying to build the largest buildings in, in, in those areas. Um, uh, I think um, Abu Dhabi is probably going to beat everyone, but uh, but there are buildings which are going to be taller than the CN Tower. The CN Tower has the distinction of being the tallest freestanding structure right now, 520 meters or so. But these buildings uh, which are planned will exceed that. So, yeah, you can design. Uh, but don't build tall buildings unless it's necessary. If the leg costs are very high, then of course you can build them. And that's what justifies this building these things. But uh, certainly they are more vulnerable. There's no doubt about that. You can do all of these things to counter this effect. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a very good point. Uh, one aspect back to more clearly at home. I understand the North Vietnam in the area, North Vietnam in the area, and North Carolina. Yeah. Has a high concentration of uh, potential for the. Okay, Canada's, um, we study Canadian seismology quite closely, I mean, my colleagues uh, do. And uh, I sit on an earthquake design committee, or code committee, where we meet every three months in mostly in Vancouver to talk about potential hazard in, in, in Canada. The most seismically active area of Canada is the West Coast. Uh, then there are areas in the Maritimes, in the St. Lawrence Valley, in the Arctic Circle, which are quite seismically active. All of the prairies are dormant. I mean, there's very little, uh, little seismic risk in those areas. You don't need to design buildings for, for earthquakes there. But Ottawa is, is fairly seismically active. We didn't have many earthquakes which are large in Canada, fortunately. Uh, but <coughs> there is a possibility that um, in the Cascadia region, which is the west coast of uh, Canada, where one plate is subducting against the other one, as, as I told you, uh, there an earthquake happens every 400, 500 years uh, or so. The last big one happened about 300 years ago. So we have another 100 year window where you have a large 8 magnitude earthquake or larger. So the west coast is, is the one which we really most worried about that we have St. Lawrence Valley, uh, the Shalibua area, the Cornwall gets some. Cornwall had an earthquake, as you know all, yeah. uh, but not very large, but it was felt by people. It was felt even in Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, so there have been earthquakes in, in this area. Even, even, even Manitoba had an earthquake. That is, that's a very dormant area, but still that had, they had an earthquake. 
So earthquakes can take place. But the most vulnerable are areas where the two continental plates meet. And they meet at the either at the mid-ocean or at the trenches along the coast. So you can see the circumpacific belt, which is most active. Yeah. Yes, please. First of all, let me compliment you a very, very informative presentation. Thank you very much. It was very educational. Uh, two part question. One, like you just mentioned right now, there is absolutely no place that is absolutely safe. Yes. Is there? Uh, from the map that you showed with white zones, there's not only the Petro Plato, which suddenly came up and became red. Yeah. So uh, I guess it's very, very unpredictable. Any yeah. part of the country, any part of the world can be uh, a zone. So, is this the scientific community any any way to predict uh, the the possibility of existence of other planes for faults? No, we pretty well know which are the most vulnerable areas. Uh, now, that doesn't mean to say that you cannot have earthquakes elsewhere, but you have to weigh this in terms of risk. Okay. Now, you want to you want to travel in air. Uh, with aeroplanes, you go in car, drive your cars. Every activity that humans undertake is fraught with risk. And um, all we can do is see what is the risk that we have of an earthquake happening at a certain place. And the risks for earthquakes happening in prairies, for example, is quite low. Uh, and therefore, if it is quite low, then you won't go and design for the same type of forces that you design buildings in West Coast, because then you'll be spending too much money. Uh, so. So society accepts certain kinds of risks in every, every activity it takes. So we know pretty well that the areas on the circumpacific belt are all prone to earthquakes. Um, the California coast, the British Columbia, the, the Alaska, uh, the Aleutian Islands, they're all vulnerable to earthquakes. And, there be, and we know exactly how much is the seismic possibility of an earthquake, what magnitude happening, how often. We have some sort of handle on that. They are, of course, in terms of probabilities. And probabilities are not helpful in evacuating, but they are helpful in letting you know what forces you need to build your building. Now, once you've done that, if you build your buildings properly, I did bring a slide of, uh, an interesting slide I had from Ahmedabad. There is this temple called Hathi Singh Temple. Beautiful temple made out of stone masonry. No mortar anywhere. And, and then there is, of course, the Jhulti Minar of Ahmedabad. Again, without water, tall minar. Now these two, the Hathi Singh temple came out unscathed, not a scratch, not a crack, nothing happened. Because these masons, they match these surfaces of these blocks very carefully by hand. Uh, so they move together. Okay, they tie together in a sort of way. Uh, so if you build proper buildings, and, and our ancestors sometimes knew how to do that, uh, then you shouldn't have much problem. Uh, visited and identified problems, the construction uh, related problems. What is the government of India doing? Well, India, well, first of all, let me tell you that Indian scientists and engineers are quite well known in knowing about earthquake engineering. They are well versed in it. The Indian codes and standards which tell you how to design buildings are quite good. They are in fact world class. Uh, Indian experts who we meet often in conferences, and I have a conference at the end of this month, which um, I'm organizing as an international conference in earthquake engineering. We have people from India coming over there. So we meet them quite often. But they are quite knowledgeable, quite good. The problem is in translating those code requirements to their field. People say, well, i never seen earthquake. Why should it happen here? Why am I going to spend some more money on, on building, uh, putting some extra reinforcement, or building or, or sacrificing my open ground floor for my tenants' parking? Uh, I mean, there are ways of girding around it, but people don't practice what is there in the region. So, so it's not that people didn't know. Now, we did... Uh, after our uh, visit, we did prepare an, a report, and I brought a copy of that. If you're interested, you can see it later on, uh, which we gave to Gujarat government as well. Uh, but as I said, Indian, Indian engineers are quite well versed with it. I mean, they don't need to learn from us. They know all of these things. But, but yes, we, we shared our observations with them. And uh, 
I think Ahmedabad has now tightened up a little bit, or Gujarat has tightened up its, uh, its requirements for earthquake design. Uh, the, some of the federal government buildings in India are built by what is called Central Public Works Department, which is central in Delhi, and they have people from what is called the Class 1 Engineering Service, which are, who are more knowledgeable about this, because they're coming through a competition. The, the Central Public Works Department buildings in Ahmedabad did not suffer because they were built according to the designs done in Delhi. Uh, so if you design the buildings properly, um, and, and India, Indian engineers know how to do that. Now there is a special government uh, task force uh, which was appointed after the Bhuj earthquake which tells how buildings in villages can be built with indigenous materials. Uh, and you have stained. So there is a whole lot of um, information that has been disseminated uh, by this task group. The Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur has a cell which uh, distributes materials for people in the field how to build from indigenous materials, schools, uh, your hospitals, and stuff. So, so there, are, there is a lot of, uh, uh, and, and there is no depth of knowledge, uh, as I said. Yeah. Uh, how many do you think the uh, earthquakes and the sea and the volcanoes have contributed to the temperature of uh, the atmospheric temperature? Yeah, uh, there's not much data on that kind of thing. I mean, the question is, do the earthquakes and the lava that comes out or under the ocean? The earthquake itself does not cause any change in temperatures. The volcanoes, which have this lava which is coming out, which might cause uh, it might cause change in change in temperature. But um, earthquakes really is a lifting of the lifting or sliding of the crust by this motion of the underlying mantle, which doesn't have to come out. But if it does come out in the form of mid-oceanic, like for the mid-oceanic ridge that you saw. There the temperature rises, uh, where the volcanic activity is. Uh, so that's the localized effect. But I don't think it contributes to global warming if you're, if you're referring to that. Uh. Do you think the magnetic north and south will be affected by this kind of activity? Yeah, yeah the, the, the polarity is of course continuously changing. Yeah, not only because of earthquake, but because of all of these underlying seismological structures. And in fact, that's how scientists have verified this theory of um, continental drift or the mid-oceanic ocean spread because there are alternate stripes of magnetic fields uh, and I didn't go into details of that but uh, the polarity of all of these stripes change as you go away from the oceanic ridge to the sidewards. That's because the Earth's polarity changes from time to time over millions of years. Okay? And North Pole becomes South and South Pole becomes North and, and so on. Uh, but that's another completely uh, different topic. I'm not very well versed with it, but it's a magnetodynamics, magneto, is the seismological people do it all the time. Oh, the change in the, in the orientation of the Earth? Yes. Yeah, well that of course is a, is a phenomenon that could be caused by the internal forces of this, uh, the drifting of the Earth. And it happened after the, well, they said after the uh, tsunami, the Sumatra earthquake, there was a small change in the orientation of the Earth, a minute change. Well, that may cause uh, changes in this, but it was pretty small, of course. Well, Dr. Kumar, what can I say? Thank you so much for a very engaging lecture. It was uh, informative, it was educational. Thanks for helping us understand the inner workings of uh, Mother Earth and how we can be in a state of awareness and indeed preparedness to mitigate some of the you know, impacts of uh, earthquakes and of course talking about the resilience of humankind. On behalf of all my colleagues on ICF, the FC board and indeed all of us here, this is a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much.
I would like to say two things. One is uh, we have recently changed our logo, if you have noticed our website. And the thanks are due to Mr. Santosh Shah. Will you stand up? He offered to redesign the logo. And uh, he has created the new logo based on the old logo design. But he has removed the technical errors plus uh, added some animation to it. It's a beautiful logo. Thank you very much, Santosh. Now, I also request uh, those who are not members of the ICFC to consider becoming members. We have got the membership forms. The details are there. You can talk to any of us. So I would invite you to become members. It helps the community and the organization. And we are trying to help the community. Thank you very much. In fact, I have a question. I don't know if I have to come in person or you can reply. I'm happy to ask either way. No, whatever is convenient to me. Just one question. Please go ahead while you're refreshing. Yeah. Oh, we are serving refreshments. Yeah. Go ahead yeah. with the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. the question is, as many questions. As you said that buildings are standing on uh, these pillars, you know, they are very risky. Yeah. Supposing a building has been constructed, there are two aspects of the question, if the pillars are of RCC, is there any, you know, adventurous animation? And second, uh, if it, is, it has not been constructed with the RCC, how can the risk be reduced? Well, okay, yeah, let's come back. Well, the question was, if, if the building has already been built with these pillars, we call them the toothpick pillars, uh, and uh, what can you do about it? Uh, and can you avoid these pillars altogether? But certainly as a functional requirement, you do want open spaces on the ground. You, you do want uh, parking areas. You do want to put your retail shops on the grounds. So you cannot ask the architecture or, or the, uh, the owner to completely eliminate open spaces. But what you can do is, there are areas on which, like, like a staircase. Around the staircase, there are four walls. Around the lift shaft, there are six walls. If they have more than one lift, there are more walls. And now you can build those walls continuous from the ground to the top and build them in reinforced concrete. They are, they are quite large as compared to the columns. So these walls will take all of the forces. The columns you don't have to rely on. Columns will still support the what is called the gravity load, the vertical force. But these walls will take care of the earthquake forces. And so you can you can even if your building is already constructed, you can raise these walls from the foundation level and tie them to the building as you go up. So we do that, we do that all the time. I mean, there are many buildings which were built uh, in the 1960s, 1965, 1970s in Canada and many other places which did not follow good earthquake engineering. Uh, now, we have codes of design now and we require that whenever you change uh, the use of the building or voluntarily, you can strengthen your building to meet earthquake requirements. In California, everybody takes earthquake risk, insurance, sorry. And if your building has been retrofitted or rehabilitated or strengthened, your premium goes down quite substantially. Uh, so people, automatically economic forces drive people to strengthen them. All of the public works building, of course, they gradually make them sound, or if they are, if they are not uh, sound. Uh, we have to do that. Parliament buildings, for example, uh, heritage buildings in uh, California, they put broad uh, bearings under the foundations and to isolate them. So yes, you can do things to, to make them stronger. And RCC plus are less risky? RCC pillars are good if there is properly reinforced. Now, when I said properly, that's a big if there. If you have got what we call stirrups or binding wire. If it is too far, then it's not good. It should be closed, and the, and the uh, reinforcement should be adequate and proper. I mean, there are lots of guidance on how to do that. But if it's properly reinforcement, it's as good as yeah. steel. Not bad at all. Actually, the authority, they don't like the of passing the back. Not, not they see the yeah, they do. Now they do. Yeah, all of the, you see, the, the requirements in, in Canada is very simple. Each construction has to be, a drawing has to be prepared, and the drawing has to be stamped or stamped by a professional engineer. The professional engineer certifies that the drawing and the design follows the code of practice, which completely describes what is to be done to resist an earthquake. Okay. If, the, if the building is not properly designed, which falls, the liability is on the designer who has stamped the drawing. So they carry malpractice insurance, of course. 
But yes, the city officials are supposed to look after, they don't have the time to go into details, but they look at the professional engineer staff there, they look cursorily that it is okay, but they rely on the professional engineers who are licensed. You cannot be licensed unless you have four years of experience after graduation from an engineering school and you have some other formalities to complete. You have to pass an ethics examination and you pass a refresher course in certain areas. And now the requirements say you have to maintain those. I mean, just like doctors. Just like doctors. You have to say, yeah. One question. Um, when you talk about course, these are provincial courses. Yeah. Uh, for example, you go for Ontario and you mention about the sectors uh, value. Now, the value might have more risk than Toronto. Yeah. Now, does the court take care of Oh, yes, oh, yes. yes. Actually, the courts are quite interesting. We have what is called the National Research Council, as you all know, and there is a court center in the Research Council, and it, it, it creates what is called a universal code, or a national code. Um, and it, in that national code, they prescribe exactly how much wind you will see in, in Ontario, or in Ottawa. In fact, you can give you latitude and longitude, and they will tell you exactly how much earthquake you, will, you should be designing for, how much wind you should be designing for, how much snow you should be designing for. Snow varies quite a lot, for example. So every single point in the, in the which you have to design for. Now those, that national code, which is, uh, which I serve on the court committee for earthquake engineering, that national code is then adopted by provinces. Okay. And then it becomes law. The national code is not a law. But once it's adopted by province, it becomes a legal document which you have to follow. And the document exactly tells you, if you are in Toronto, how much is the earthquake force? If you are in Ottawa, how much is the earthquake force? If you are in Winnipeg, how much is the earthquake force? So it's all so taken care of. In other words, what you are saying, the force will vary from the time. Yeah, the, the, the details of the code vary. Right? The force of the hazard or the risk keeps on changing depending on where you are. And then, of course, the practice is similar how you then take care of that, but, uh, but first of all you have to know how much is your uh, hazard. Yeah.